mercies are new every morning. And the more mornings you have, the more you know his mercy. That takes away the dread of getting older. <laughs> You'll know him better. I'd like to invite your attention tonight to the book of Acts, 26th chapter, beginning with the 12th verse. Paul is standing before King Agrippa near the end of his life, and he's sharing his testimony of what happened to him on the road to Damascus. And because of this kind of testimony, Agrippa was able to say to him later, he almost persuaded me to become a Christian. But we're going to listen in to what Paul said, what happened to him and what he heard. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way. Now before Antioch, Christians were not called Christians. Christians were called Christians the first time at Antioch. Before that time, they were called people of the way. They used to be way people <laughs> because they knew the way. And they knew him who said he is the way. And so Paul got in the way of way people. <laughs> I hope some more people get in the way of way people. <clears throat> Midday, O King, I saw in the way a light from heaven above, above the brightness of the sun. And the Holy Ghost didn't say he was exaggerating. The light was brighter than the noonday sun, shining around about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, now God had a mass fallen in the spirit service. Come on. Knocked them all down at one time. Nobody had to lay hands on them and push them down. They were all fallen to the earth. I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? Isn't it interesting? He's in the way with a decree in his pocket to slaughter the Christians. Yet when this voice spoke to him, he said, Who art thou, Lord? He knew who he was because he called him Lord. Who art thou, Lord? Now that'll preach, and if you don't, have, don't think about it, if you don't understand it, just put it on the back burner. It'll come back later. And the voice answered, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Now listen to what God said to him. Arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. That's specific. That's definite. I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly purpose. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I was not disobedient to the purpose for which you call me. And I know what that purpose is, he said. 
I know why I've been brought to the kingdom at such an hour as this, and I know what I'm supposed to do because I heard it from God. I paraphrased it, but that's exactly what he said. God said to him, I want you to stand to your feet. I have called you to the ministry for this, not these, this purpose. That you might be a witness to what you've heard and what I shall yet tell you. So the preacher doesn't preach what he's just heard. He's supposed to continually preach what is continually being shown. A witness, according to the laws of our land, before they can be accepted as a witness in the courts of our land, they have to be able to qualify to at least three or four major points. The first is, they must be able to say, I saw it with my own eyes, or I heard it with my own ears, or I touched it with my own hands. If you can testify to those three, they'll let you stay in the witness box and give witness to the incident. If not, you're disqualified. John said, mine eyes have seen, my ears have heard, and my hands have handled the word of life. I wonder tonight how much we are witnesses. That's not ringing doorbells, studying the romance of the doorbell, or even handing out tracts, and I'm not against that. But our conception of witness is totally different from what the Bible said. The Bible said we shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit's come upon us. Not when, but after that. Read it like it says it. After that, ye shall be witnesses unto me, living dead martyrs. That's exactly what the word witness means in the Greek. Living dead martyrs who have seen, heard, and handled and know the one they're testifying about. That's a whole lot different than knocking on a doorbell or ringing the doorbell. Do I make sense tonight? Paul, stand on your feet and listen to what I have to say. I have brought you in the way to be a minister of the gospel for this purpose. I know of nothing tonight more tragical than an untimely death for someone who's not ready to meet God next to that than to be living in this world as a Christian or as anyone and not know the purpose for which you were born. Now please hear me. I've come a long ways. I've walked many a mile. I've traveled over many a road in the ministry before I could say that to anyone tonight. But I can say it without blinking an eye. I think the next thing to untimely death is to be living in this world and not know why you were born. If you don't know the purpose for which God made you, if you don't know the purpose for which God brought you to the earth, then how do you know whether you'll ever do it or not? And if you did it, how would you know you did it? And if you finished it, how would you know you finished it? If you didn't finish it, how would you know you didn't know what to finish? Now, I'm not preaching the sermonette tonight. I'm not looking for a place to preach. I don't have a sermonette for Christianettes. I'm not worried about homiletics or hermeneutics or anacrostics or anything else tonight. I have a burning message on my heart that literally consumes me these days, and I make no apology for it. 
I want to look you straight in the face tonight and ask you a question as if it were the last time I ever looked at your face. Do you know, without a doubt, why the infinite, almighty, eternal God created you and put you in this world? Do you know what for? Have you found your purpose in life? If you staggered into it, you'll stagger out. If you don't know that you know you know, there's only one reason why you don't. You haven't been to the one who made you to ask him why he made you. The manufacturer of a product is the only one who really knows what's in his mind and what he wants out of the product he makes. There's no such thing as a church being without Christ or without being a move of the Spirit, or without being on the timely cutting edge of the Holy Ghost, unless they've lost their purpose or never knew it. You see, I'm convinced that our life is never on pivot until we know the purpose for which we've been born. You're not an accident. You're not the result of your mother and daddy falling in love, being married, or someone's lust. Do you know tonight that you're here by divine appointment? Yeah. Do you know tonight, do you believe tonight there's a purpose for your life? Yeah. If so, put your hand up and wave it at me. Yeah. Now, don't put your hand up this time, I would not trap you, but do you know Answer in your own heart, are you satisfied without a doubt that you know why God created you? Do you know why he brought you at the kingdom at this hour? He could have brought you here when Sarah was here. He could have brought you here before, the, before Calvary because you were anyway. You aren't as young as you think you are. <laughs> so don't look at me like I'm getting old. You're as old as I am. You may not have had your earthly suit as long as I've had mine. But we're all we're redeemed. Our names were already written down the Lamb's Book of Life before God ever made time on man, so that makes us all old. Now, I don't feel by myself. Come on. I'd get you there some way. See, I'm not playing with you. I want these words to sink in till you hear them as your wheels turn over going down the mountains. I want them to sink in till next week you'll think them until there'll be no sleep and rest, until you're totally satisfied in your spirit without a doubt that you know why God brought you to Christendom at this hour. You are a daughter and a son of destiny. Come on. You're not a haphazard, an accident, or a result of somebody's love, except God's. But you were before the world was ever formed. Your name was already written in the Lamb's Book of Life then. And the ones that made you decided when they wanted you here. Now, if you hear me tonight, you have just listened this weekend on several people telling us that we're on the brink of a brand new day that we're about to help usher in and go with the new generation into our inheritance. I believe that with everything there is within me. For I've heard it ever since 1963, and I've known it was going to come to pass. We are now on the verge of the greatest move of God there's ever been in the history of the world. The church has come into the fullness of the revelation that's been progressive 
under the direction of the third person that God had that's broken light, line upon line, until now, the Spirit's not going to just give us a word of knowledge, but to the church, the prayer of the Holy Spirit's going to be answered and is being answered, that God may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge and understanding, and the church is coming to the fullness of the fullness of the last hour, when revelation is going to be the fullest it's ever been. And all of us who have the Holy Spirit want to hear can have the mind of God and be in on what God's doing when the church is full of His glory. When the church is full of His glory. When the church is full of His glory. It's never been full of His glory before. When God's going to put his hand on the switch and release that river that's not coming from the throne except the throne of these vessels. And out of our inmost being is coming the old-fashioned, heaven-sent, sky-blue, sin chilly gutter-washing revival that's going to produce a harvest. And it's coming out of you and me. It's coming out of the church when she's been cleansed, sanctified, not cranktified, but sanctified, until there'll be nothing in her. Are you listening? When Satan comes and looks at her, he'll have to take to his heels because there'll be nothing in us to cooperate with him. And that's when the spiritual war will be won. That's when we'll tear down the heavens. That's when the church will go where she belongs and dethrone Satan and get out of our territory. The heavens belong to us. They don't belong to him. He thinks he's the prince and power of the air. But I have news for you. We who've been redeemed were translated out of darkness and been raised and seated together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that realm is our territory and Satan is under our feet, not over us. And the church has nothing that Satan can stand back and laugh at us. You can stand out there and call all the powers down you want to over your city. But until you've got the ones in this city conquered, you won't do a thing with those out there. Come on. Come on, let's go with it. And when God does this cleansing, sanctifying, purging, work in the church, and the church stands, and he knows who we are, and there's nothing in him to cooperate with him, and he comes and finds nothing in us. The church will rise with the glory of God being revealed, transfigured in them, and shout to the gates of hell, move back, here comes the church. Now, I know that I know that I know that. And to think that it let us, you and me, be here at this time when the Holy Ghost is going to be poured out to the fullest in the latter part of the latter part of the latter part of the latter days and the latter rain comes, we're here. We're on the verge of a deluge. And my father said, daughter, when I pulled that switch this time, I've told you before, he said, no demon, devil, man, or denomination will ever damn it up again.
Has it ever dawned on you where you're living? Has it ever dawned on why you're here? Are you aware tonight that you're a daughter of destiny? And that God in his mercy brought you here at the fullness of the hour? When revelation's going to be the fullest it's ever been? When sons and daughters shall both prophesy? You won't have to defend yourself. You won't have to fight. You won't have to be mannish. Just be under the spout where the glory is coming out and let the glory run through you. And you won't need anybody to go ahead of you and defend you. Because the anointing will declare the message you have is a message of prophecy. Sons and daughters shall. Not maybe so, not might so, not perhaps so, not if the preacher says so, not if the denomination decides it, if some committee decides it. God Almighty said, when I pour out my spirit in the last of the last days, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your mature saints shall know the heart of God and know his dream and take it to the church and the young men will grab their swords and women and run with it to the ends of the earth and God's going to pour out his spirit way in the smack dab on the cutting edge of it. I don't have anything on earth next to untimely death without God than to be living and not know why you were put here and especially at this hour. Now if you couldn't know it would be another story. But you can know. Don't depend on someone else to give you a word to find out. You'll never get somebody else to tell you why the manufacturer made something. Go to the one that made it. And have him to explain to you why he made you. And why he made you like he did and didn't make anybody else on earth like you. But if you like anybody else, somebody's out of order. If you like anybody else, somebody's out of order. Or somebody duplicated and it wasn't God. Because God doesn't duplicate. He told me he didn't run a copy machine. He told me he didn't even have a hundred editions. He said, anything I made has never been like anything else. I never made any two things. I never made any two things alike. And that put me on a search, and he was right, of course. <laughs> you can't find anything that has any life in it that's like anything else. Maybe similar, but not identical. All right. We've got a lot of people in this world who think they can tell us how to find what's in this world. We've got some small brains. We've got some little brains that have become so overwhelmed by the magnitude of our great universe that our Father made that the immensity of the parts of it have been so awe-inspiring grandeur of its beauty that they sense a divine purpose but they're not willing to admit that somebody who had a purpose made it. Back of it seems lost in the grandeur of the foliage and they never know why. Those shriveled souls are passing and posing as great pioneers of the frontiers. They say that they are pioneers of the cosmic expanses and they're passing as educators. They're teaching in our colleges. They have their degrees in our universities. They've come to lead us in the new realms of knowledge, they tell us. And they're trying to think, to find out who made what they're seeing and the purpose of it. But man's just a mere speck of human flesh, is what they say, drifting on a boundless sea of cosmic space. So far as those educators and our teachers 
and the philosophers of our generation are concerned, man is rudderless, man is chartless, man is purposely with no destiny, having obscurity at our starting point and oblivion at our destiny. But for us to say tonight that we're children of God, for us to stand up and testify tonight that we're born again Christians, that we're sons and daughters of the Most High God, the Creator of heaven and earth, and the one would not have dared done anything without a purpose. For us to testify tonight that we're his child, and further than that, to say we're his ambassador and ambassadress, and not know the purpose for which he made us is contradictory to the nature of our God. I hope you heard me. That statement contradicts God. God didn't fling this world into space for no reason. We're not the result of some explosion of gas. Man doesn't have to get out in the cosmic sphere to find out why we're here. We know who made it. We know what he had in mind before he made it. We know why he made it, and we know why he made us. That means we have a better education than they do. Amen? Amen? Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit tonight about purpose. And I wouldn't try, wouldn't endeavor if I were you to memorize it or to retain it because you won't do it. So get out your paper. This is the teacher in me. Get out your paper and pencil. And this is copyrighted. I copied it down and it's right. So you have a right to it. Why is it so necessary for me to have purpose? What I'd like to do tonight is share with you some things that purpose will do to your life. And I beg you to hear it. I want you to think it over and over and over and over and go back again and again and look at it and see if it's operative in your life. Purpose gives life a pungent, dynamic authority, forceful. The Bible says that Jesus spake as one having authority. Now all of us want authority, but we usually want the wrong kind of authority. We want a rule. But I want to talk to you about the authority that Jesus spoke with. He spoke with authority of knowing. Now I'm going to say a word that you perhaps are going to say, what in the world is wrong with that woman? There's great knowing in knowing. And there's no authority without knowing. When you know, you know something that gives you an authority beyond over the ones that don't know. Now I'm not talking about dominion. I'm talking about the authority to know what you know is right. So authority is given because of purpose. Your authority is established when you know the reason you're called and the purpose for which your life is. And I think you'll let me use my name myself for example because I know more about me than I do anybody else since I've lived in this house this many years. But someone might say, why does that woman seem so sure? Is it she's cocky and I don't like that word? Is it she's presumptuous? Is she ambiguous? Someone say it's the anointing? Yes, it's the anointing. But why do I go where I'm going, do what I'm doing, 
and know tonight without a doubt that what I'm doing is what I was made to do is because the one who made me told me so. Three years ago when my father said to me, I want you to go to the body of Christ at large, my mandate was specific. I want you to look for leaders and I want you to help them to get ready along with many, many other mothers and daddies in Israel out there. Help them to get ready and be on the cutting edge of what I'm about to do in the church. I want you to go pour your life into leaders, sons and daughters in the ministry. My father has so controlled my schedule that I don't find myself in churches that that commission can't be fulfilled. I haven't been in one, but one that I doubted, and I didn't doubt the church that meant the pastor missed it. But every church but one I've been in, I've been aware that the pastor is being told, has been told, or is being told by God what's on the horizon. And I've already been in 60-some churches this year. and foreign countries, and on the way this next year to countries I've never touched the soil to work with the ministers. Three weeks ago I had the privilege to preach to 27 different countries, pastors, in 27 different countries in one service. When my daddy said, go do it, I don't have to worry about it because I know he'll do it. He just wanted somebody he could use in spite of me for his glory. Why do you think I board planes? It's kind of stupid to ask me if I love to travel. They say, do you like to travel? I answer, well, it has indeed increased my prayer life. <laughs> do you think I would have chosen the most golden years of my life? to slept in motels that I'd never seen before, go to bed at night and not even remember where I am when I wake up to go to the bathroom. And that's not because I'm seen all, it's because I've never been in that room before. I have to lay there for a few moments and so I've quit trying to wrestle with the dark. I leave the bathroom light on so I'll have some directions which way to go, not worry about it and go back to bed I wake up in the morning in the city I'm supposed to be in. Don't know who my person next door to me is. Don't know who's sleeping in the next room, whether they're drunk. Now you look at me like this. Do you think I would have chosen a life like that? You think that's glamorous? Look across the floor in some hotels and you have visitors. have to drink out of plastic glasses, which I hate. One little pastor gave me a little Wedgwood Christian glass to put in my suitcase to take with me, so I wouldn't have to drink out of plastic. You see, I like crystal in China. But that has to stay back in Tennessee while I go to somebody else's city. But I never have one day But what I know, I'm doing what I was brought to the kingdom for at this hour. That never has to cross my mind that I'm not. There was a time in my life I didn't have that security. So I can stand in a meeting and speak with an authority that's not mine because I know the purpose. So purpose gives you an authority. All right, I won't stay on the others that long. Show me a man or a woman, a boy or girl, who's become conscious of the divine purpose for their life, and I'll show you someone that preaches, speaks, teaches, lives, 
In fact, everything they say almost comes out of a knowledge of divine authority. I begin to wonder why we have so many lukewarm churches. Now hear my heart. Why are there so many churches today where God used to be? Where people are sitting around talking about the good old days. But why do you think my father had to tell me three or four years ago that the revival wouldn't come to America lest we had a more intimate knowledge of the third person of the Godhead? There's been added to that two other things. One of them is because our church in America is not walking in obedience. I'm going to ask you something. How can we have the audacity stand up and testify to being spirit-filled at the same time say we're walking in disobedience? I disagree with it. For the Bible said if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And where there's no light, there's a vacuum for darkness. And where there's darkness, that's territory for the enemy. Now, who heard me? I'm dropping some mouthfuls. Pick them up. And you cannot be having Christ the light shed abroad full in your heart if you're in disobedience. And how can you say you're spirit-filled if you're walking in disobedience? The church in America thinks nothing about saying, I'm dragging my feet. I don't want to do it. I'm just in disobedience. But it's in him that knoweth to do right and doeth the not to him it's sin. And it's high time we wake up and have a Holy Ghost cleansing of all of our disobedience and rise to walk in heaven's light above the world in sin with heart made pure and garment white and Christ enthroned within. Don't come giving me this stuff you left skid marks all the way. I had a lady walk up at Fountain Gate one morning and say to me when I was pastoring there, Hello, I'm here. Well, I waited for her to drop the other shoe. So what? She just looked at me and said, I'm here. Well, that wasn't the only person in that church that morning. And I said, yes. Well, I'm here. I said, you are? She said, I'm here. I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from California. No reflection on California. It could have been from Timbuktu. She said, I'm from California. But she said, I left skid marks all the way. Well, that didn't happen to sit well with this preacher that morning. <laughs> so I looked at her and said, well, if you've left skid marks all the way, my suggestion is you go back to California where you came from. And so you can come with no skid marks. We have enough rebellion in our church we don't need anymore. She went back, made it right with God. I didn't know whether she'd ever come back or not. But she came back, and this time she didn't walk up and say, I'm here. She said, I didn't leave any skid marks. I said, welcome to Fountain Gate. <laughs> we brag about how we have to be drugged to obey God. Then sing, I love you. It's quiet in here. Will somebody on this side say amen or something? Do something. <laughs> Our church is full of apathy. Love for materialism. Walking in disobedience. And the other thing the man said was wrong with us, that God said is, we know very little about authority. It's a result of not knowing the Holy Spirit more intimate, intimately, walking in rebellion, disobedience, amen, and not being under anyone and submitted to anyone. We're freelancers. That we'll stay in the hand of God from pouring out His Spirit in His fullness on our country. I hope this weekend we'll make up our mind by the grace of God. No more disobedience. No more resisting authority, divine authority. 
we'll know the Holy Spirit better and we'll find out why we're here. Let's get on with the program. Amen. And tell God we are ready for the revival. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? All right. I can give you the answer why churches are like that. No doubt the pastors of those churches have long ago lost the purpose. And the parishioners don't know what that church is there for. But when you know the purpose, and the church knows its purpose, it has a reason to exist, and it moves on with a vision. Can you say amen? amen. All right. Now keep writing. Purpose takes care of commitment. You ought to be shouting, but you're writing, aren't you? Purpose takes care of commitment. You'll never again say the word, don't preach commitment to me. It's legalism. It's bondage. You won't need it preached to you anymore. I said you won't need commitment preached to you anymore. People that have a purpose know why they're there. They don't have Sunday morning mentality. And they don't jump from post to post. They are committed. And commitment is settled and never has to be preached to you again when you know what you've been called to do. So it's high time we get back to preaching purpose. Purpose justifies life's greatest sacrifice to follow God. There's no sacrifice too great to pay for the one who knows why they're here. I used to wonder why Paul was treated like he was. I was taught better than to argue with God or act like I wanted to question anybody knows my heart. I kind of want to say, Lord, I don't think you quite treated Paul right. He was a great man, wrote 14 of the books if he wrote Hebrews. Wrote 13 of the books. And yet that man spent so much of his life in prison. And right in prison he would shout, talk about the glory of God and the joy of the Lord. And I wondered if he's having hallucinations almost. But I woke up one day and realized Paul didn't, didn't matter to Paul where his pulpit was or where his writing table was. He knew what he was here for and all he was concerned about was getting it done and knowing it was finished. And when it was done, he said, it's finished. And you know, they was going to try to kill him once, several times. But one time, he found out they going to kill him, and he sent word back, they won't kill me, I haven't been to Rome yet. <laughs> he must have known something. Can you say they won't get me, I haven't been there yet? You talk about faith. Purpose gives direction to motives. It lets you know why you're doing what you're doing, when you're doing it, and what you're doing it for. You have a motive to do what you're doing. Purpose sanctifies any Christian trial. And we wonder why we're no more like Jesus than we are is because we haven't allowed the purpose of God to be worked in our life and our trials to sanctify our testings. Well, you're quiet. I brought a few amens. If I have to, I can use my own. <laughs> I'd rather use yours. Purpose mollifies anyone's persecution. Well, you don't know what I have to go through with. You'd, I, I'd get the baptism, but you don't know what my church would say. So what? What do you care what somebody says as long as you're walking in the will of God? I get so sick of this thing of people being so spirit-filled, yet they're so afraid of people. There are a lot of men tonight would pull out the stop and let God do with women what God wants to do if they weren't scared of their men peers. 
and that denotes to me somebody doesn't know the purpose of God. The purpose of God will overrule anybody's fear or any peer. And women won't have to lick anybody's bootstraps or anything else to do what God's called us to do. And neither will men. You don't have to bow to anybody over you and keep you from doing the will of God when you know the purpose. Am I making sense? There's a knowledge that comes in obedience. It gives content to one's actions. Why do they do what they're doing? There's a content to what they're doing and why. Purpose gives force to character. I love it. Purpose gives force to character. It makes character. I mentioned this morning in the message and teaching that in studying the biographies of some of our church fathers, let me name three of them tonight that are very common to most of us. That's Luther, Wesley, and Moody. In studying their lives, I found out that all three of these men were hopelessly flounders. They flip-flopped. They were not steady in their commitment or their work or their service for God. Read it in their own history, the history of them. When each one of them knew that they knew that they knew why they'd been brought to the kingdom, it settled their lives and they never again floundered. Martin Luther was not afraid to nail his thesis on the doors of the Edinburgh church. He knew why he had been brought to the kingdom to preach the message of faith and he did it. He floundered, read his story. John Wesley was a man that flipped around and was traveling, didn't even know why he was traveling. They had an altogether experience, he still floundered until God gave him his direct purpose that he brought him to the kingdom. And from then on, he never batted an eye in opposition to what God called him to do. Now, the Methodist Church may not be in its general today what it was one day, but it was a great move of God. And I have news for you, you may not catch this, but the Holy Ghost will bring it back later. Once Ruth had delivered the baby boy, she laid him in the arms of Naomi. And Naomi is going to be restored as same as Ruth. For in every denomination where there's a fire in that bosom, when the revival comes, the river's not going to miss that vessel. For well, the roofs of the hour are going to present Jesus to Naomi's. All oh, that makes you want me to teach on Ruth. I love to teach on Ruth. I love to teach on Esther. But now listen. After that, they had a distinct, divine, dynamic purpose. And the very instant they found out their purpose it became forceful in their character. Purpose gives contents to action, but listen. The faithful but unappreciated preacher will keep preaching when he has a purpose. The loving but unappreciated mother will quit griping about being nothing but a mother when she knows the purpose God gave her those children for. That slew foot comes around and sits on your shoulder and said, you are not in the ministry. I am the greatest in the world. You have a built-in congregation and they can't get up and walk out on you. I was praying in Nashville. I've been there for a convention. Started out to be women, but the men said nothing doing. Sister Pickett's coming to town, we're coming too, so we had men and women's convention. There's as many men as there was women. They came on visiting, but they came back next morning too. 
So we didn't have a women's convention, we just had a convention. They asked me if I'd take time to pray for the leaders and the ministers, and I did. It's a lengthy long line. One of the ladies stood in front of me and the Spirit said to me, she's not one of them. And the lady had distinctly said, I am asking only for ordained ministers in this particular prayer line, for those in full-time ministry, and she qualified it and said, now if you're not, when this lady stood in front of me, the Spirit says she's not, and she's not truthful. And that wasn't good to hear. And so I wasn't going to bless her, and she just kept trying to get near me. And I looked at her and I said, are you a minister? Well, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Well, yes. No. <laughs> the Holy Ghost wouldn't let her lie anymore to me. And she said, well, one to one. I said, I hope so. She said, but I've got six children. And something in me rose up. I think it was good. And I looked at her and said, you have your built-in congregation. Go home and preach to your church first. God's not a homebreaker. I told you this morning, he's not the author of confusion. And he's never touched my home to hurt it. He's made it richer and fuller because of the call of God on our life. And I didn't pray for her. I blessed her and said, run on, honey, and take care of your congregation. I sensed that when that little woman felt she was nobody, because she wasn't a preacher. You didn't hear what I said this morning. You maybe heard it, but I trust you remember it. If what you're doing now is the will of God for your life at this time, there's nothing on earth you could do more noble. And if you have children, Don't let the enemy tell you that you're not in the ministry. Don't let him tell you that your life is not important. Once you know the purpose of why God gave you those children, nothing will ever make you feel inferior again. Come on, ladies, I thought you'd shout. Show the sacrificing mother. Go ahead and give the Lord a clap offering. Show the sacrificing mother that what she's doing is for God's glory and his purpose, and she'll be faithful and onward with no badgering of the enemy, for purpose provides motivation to her life, and every day she'll know she's raising them for the glory of God. That's why every day you lay your hands on them, you pray over them and tell them, I'm not raising you for the devil. I'm not raising you for this world. You're marked and I've marked you. I've dedicated you to God. And I'm here to see to it that you find out the purpose of God. And we're going to pray together until you know why you are born. The devil wouldn't get our children so easily. If they knew what they're here for, and so many other people wouldn't influence them in schools of ungodly teaching if they had been grounded in the fact of why they were born. <laughs> Show the minister why he's ministering, though unappreciated. Show him that he's fulfilling God's divine purpose, and he instantly knows no defeat. Show that mother and she'll never again be badgered. Look at me. The world may scorn you. Friends may laugh at you. The enemy may accuse you that you're not doing anything in God's kingdom of the ministry. <clears throat> Even if your friends jeer, once God's revealed his divine purpose to you in your life, you'll be like Atlas. You can carry the world on your shoulders and keep going on with the thing that demands your time and all this within you because you know the purpose of God. Now, purpose will feed your faith. 
For faith without a vision is nothing. That word vision is the word without prophecy. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Without a vision, the people perish. That word in the Hebrew really reads. Some of you that studied it, nodding your head at me, just looked up your Hebrew. Without prophecy, God's people perish. In other words, if there's not a prophetic, up-to-date direction which way we're going, we don't know which way to go. And without purpose, God's people perish. Purpose enthuses your spirit. It just gets you all excited. Somebody said, I don't understand how you're so excited. Well, I just told you. I know why I'm here. <laughs> well, glory. Hallelujah. Purpose enlarges your hopes. Purpose empowers your will. I will to will to do his will, and his will becomes my will. My will becomes his will, his will becomes my will, and I become the will of God when I know the purpose of his will. You say that one tomorrow if you can. Okay. <laughs> purpose envelops your emotions. That'll set you free. Purpose does to life what fire does to water. It boils one's consecration into the power that turns the wheel of divine progress. You don't have anything to motivate you, get your water boiling. And the wheel of divine purpose will start rolling inside of you. Purpose is written in everything that God has made, so enjoy this and listen. You can see purpose in the grass that's under your feet. There's a purpose in this world. Art holds in its hand many proofs of the purpose of this world. History reverberates with the tread of mighty men that have moved down through the eras of time, through its pages that have carried out the divine purpose of God. One cannot look in any direction with knowledge and not know that everything God made, he made for purpose. I close tonight, let me say to you, God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for your life. You didn't just happen. You didn't just get here by chance. God has a divine purpose for you. If you're not aware of it, it's one of two reasons. You didn't know you could know, or you haven't bothered to ask. Some of us didn't ask because we didn't know we could know. We just stumbled upon God when he saved us from sin. And we had no pivot to the direction of our life and we testified to preaching the gospel. And what we preached was an escape route from hell. We preached the good news of what our daddy had in mind when he made us. What he wanted out of us and what's gonna become of us. Life goes on pivot. Can you say amen? amen? Dedicate your life to him. Seek him until he tells you what your purpose is. He was a sightless man. Caused more people to see than anybody else ever has. Great things of God. Beethoven was totally deaf. and wrote the greatest scores of music because he found out what he was here for. Doubting Luther caused men to believe. No age, no race, no color, no sin, no unfaithfulness has anything to do with it. Now where you've been is where you're going. If you'll seek God's purpose, I have news for you. You're destined to be a vessel of his glory. You're destined to be a vessel of his glory. If you're here tonight, oh, I know, the enemy will drag up your past. Who are you to find out 
And I'm going to ask there be no more moving now because I'm closing. I want everything still. It's not time to leave. Let's hear the last of it. Since Satan's going to be the only one that's going to remember your past in eternity anyway, let him have it. I quit paying any attention to it. God's forgot it. And in heaven, nobody else will remember it. So you might as well forget it right tonight and say, by the grace of God, I'm not going to live any longer until I'm at least in pursuit of the knowledge of knowing why my Father made me, saved me, bought me, brought me here at this time. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here tonight and you want with all your heart to say, Sister Pickett, I want to know God's purpose for my life. There are many of you that already know it. But if you're here and you're not sure about why God brought you here, you don't know what you're supposed to do in life, and you wouldn't know if you got to finish it or not because you don't know, because you haven't spent time asking the one who made you. But you'd like that information to be yours, and from tonight on you're going to ask your father to teach you what he had in mind when he made you. You want to know the purpose of God for your life. So when you get ready to leave here, you can say, I finished the course. If that's the desire of your heart tonight, stand to your feet, wherever you are. Look at this. Look at this. Can you say amen with me? Stretch your hand this way, not to me, but out to him. Heavenly Father, as I look out over this congregation tonight and I see all these hands, it's not possible for us, furthermore you don't need us, to go out and touch these precious sisters and others that are standing tonight. But I thank you that you know the desires of our heart. You said you'll give us the desires of our heart. Now, Father, I ask tonight that you set into action, set into motion whatever it takes to bring us into the knowledge that we're going to find the purpose of God for our life. We'll live for the reason we were put here, and nothing and nobody will stop us from doing the will of God. For once we've willed our will, his will becomes our will, and we become the will of God. And Lord, you promised us that, and you cannot fail us. Your will becomes our will, and we become the will of God. We become the purpose of God. So tonight, we're going to will our wills. We're going to will our wills. We're going to will our wills to know the purpose of God. And Father, by the grace of God, we're going to start listening for your teaching on the purpose, because we're going to fulfill the purpose for which we were born. Having received the purpose for which you brought them to this convention for, change lives, put them on pivot, and bring a victory in this place that nothing else would have brought, because the truth sets people free. We, and we believe it, and we thank you in advance for it, because we know we're praying in your will. And you said if we pray in your will, you hear us. And if you hear us, we have the petition. Come on, saints. We have the petition we've asked of him. Say, I will know. He will teach me. And I will live his eternal purpose in my life. From tonight on, I set my will to fulfill the purpose for which he brought me into this world. Amen?
Amen. God bless you.